Welcome to the Control the Room podcast, a series devoted to the exploration of meeting culture and uncovering cures for the common meeting. Some meetings have tight control and others are loose. To control the room means achieving outcomes while striking a balance between imposing and removing structure, asserting and distributing power, leaning in and leaning out, all in the service of having a truly magical meeting. Today, I am with Regine Gilbert, who works at New York University, where she is an industry assistant professor. She is also the author of Inclusive Design for a Digital World, Designing with Accessibility in Mind. Welcome to the show, Regine. Oh, thank you. Happy to be here. It's great to have you. So I'm really curious to hear just a little bit about how you got your start. I think working in accessibility and, and design is really important work. And I think if you're anywhere similar to my age, there was certainly no degree in this. So how did, how did you find yourself doing this work? How did you get there? Well, I first started in user experience design about seven years ago. So I haven't been in it uh, as long as, as some others uh, in the area. And when I got into user experience design, I didn't really know much at all about accessibility. I believe the course that I took had one slide uh, from what I remember. But I w- woke up one day and I said, I want to make the world a more accessible place. And, you know, of course, I go to Google and I'm like, accessibility, what does that mean? <laughs> and I, when I put in accessibility in New York, uh, I found a meetup and I was, um, luckily, the meetup was happening, I think, within a week of when I had Googled this. And I went to my very first um, A11Y NYC meetup. So A11Y is a numeronym for accessibility. There's 11 characters between the A and the Y. And I went to this meetup and I met some people who are still my friends to this day. And I really just got into accessibility and learning about it and applying it to my work. And at the time I was doing freelance uh, UX research work and I was looking at websites and doing information architecture stuff. And I was like, you know, your your website's not accessible. And they're like, what does that mean? And it's like, well, that means, you know, people with disabilities can't really access your site and you're excluding them. And um, they're like, we had no idea. And so, and I just found that more and more people knew very little about it. And that led me to speaking about it. And the speaking about it led to me writing the book. I want to talk a little bit about just how (laughs) that moment you had when you searched on accessibility and, you know, it's like, how do I even define this? And I think that awareness is the first step, right? And you even talk about these companies that didn't even realize that they had a problem or even that there was such a thing. So I'm curious how your definition of accessibility has changed over the years and how it's continuing to evolve. Yeah, I think that when I first um, you know, got into it, I was really web focused. And then I started looking into other areas and looking into service and service design and building because now, you know, I, I notice if I'm in a building and I'm like, well, somebody with a wheelchair couldn't come in here, there's mm-hmm. no space, or they couldn't use the bathroom here. You know, so I just over the years, I've become I've become a lot more aware of, of the inaccessibility of the the world and society in a lot of ways and yeah that's that's how it's changed and evolved is like i i notice more so what have you been noticing since covid as we've all been thrust into these virtual environments oh that people with disabilities said you you should have listened to us all along see people right. can work from home uh that's the one of the bigger lessons is is that all these companies who said oh no we can't have people working from home and all of a sudden you can and you know once once you know the um Haben Germa who's uh deaf and blind says people are disabled or non-disabled and you know when when a majority of like non-disabled people need to work from home all of a sudden there's a way to make it work right Mm. um so that has been interesting i think that uh, a lot of people in the disability community are like welcome to our world because this is how we function a majority of the time we can't be around a lot of people and 
and that isolation you feel, you know, that's something we feel quite often. And I think that we have seen, it's it's like the best of times and the worst of times (laughs) in some ways, in that we've seen people really come together, form different groups, um, form different communities. But then we've seen the antithesis of that and people saying, oh, this isn't real. We don't care about other people. And they're being really, you know, really silly and selfish about it all. So I, I think we've seen a duality of the best of times and the worst of times during this pandemic. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. You, you pointed out how like being forced into the situation kind of created empathy. Uh, you could argue that it's artificial, but it's, mm-hmm. it's there. It's like what, the forcing function is like manifest it. And it reminds me of the activity of a day in the life or like in the shoes where I've even heard stories of designers walking around on their knees to think about the experience of children, right? Mm. And even people putting themselves in a wheelchair to like, let's navigate the space or do these things, trying to see through the lens of that experience. And so I'm kind of curious, like, how do you take that a step further than just like the, you know, I'm sure there's some advanced techniques there that could be explored. Yeah, I think, you know, there there's varying opinions on doing simulations. Uh, some people in the disability community feel that they're not accurate because mm-hmm. you're putting yourself in a wheelchair, but you're, you're not a wheelchair user. So you may find it extremely difficult because it's your first time doing it. And then you just make that assumption that it's always difficult, you know? Mm. And so then I think the best thing that you can do is actually get actual people with disabilities involved in whatever it is you're creating and have them be a part of the process and get them, you know, hire them, get them to give input because there's nothing better than getting it from the source. I love to hear that. That's awesome. And so let's think about the virtual meeting space. Are there, as we've been in a force to, you know, spend our days on Zoom and use tools like Mural, et cetera, are there things that you are noticing or that you've known but are just being exacerbated now that uh, that maybe more people should be paying attention to? I think you know we've we've discovered uh, the limitations of of things like Zoom that are not really necessarily welcoming to people who are deaf because there's no captions that are provided through Zoom. You have to have a third party. Mm -hmm. Whereas with, let's say, Google Meet, for example, you can actually see who's talking because they use machine learning for captions. And even if you're doing a presentation on Google Slides, you can also use captions so that someone can read along. And there are other different like artificial intelligence plugin things that you can use for Zoom. But it's it's I think we see that that these tools that we're using are not as accessible as we wish. I mean, sometimes it's not even about a person being disabled, but they might be in an environment that's super loud and Mm -hmm. they would love to have captions because their kids, you know, there's three kids are having their Zoom classes behind them. And even though they have their headphones on, it's really hard to focus. So I think that we've seen a bit of limitation with with the tools themselves as we've we've gone through this process of being pretty much online and looks like we're not getting out of this anytime soon. You know, the, it, it also makes me think of, you know, some things we've run into with some of our workshops where there's like, there's socioeconomical imbalances as well. There's accessibility issues where people maybe don't have good internet or they don't have, you know, a powerful laptop or computer because, um, you, you know, there are requirements to run these things. Yeah. And I, you know, in the United States, more than half of the country does not have high speed internet. And so a lot of the things that, you know, people are like, well, keep, you know, we'll do Zoom and, I, you know, I want everybody to keep their, their cameras on. I was like, not everybody can keep their cameras on. Mm-hmm. It really will just shut down, <laughs> you know, and, and I think we need to be mindful of that. Not everyone has what we have. If you're in a bigger city, uh, you really need to be mindful of, of where people might be coming from and what might be best for them to communicate. Maybe it's just better for them to call in 
and that should be fine. And at the end of the day, I've had the pleasure of working with uh, Gus Chalkius as a, he's an adjunct professor at NYU and he's also blind and he and I have uh, teach a class called Looking Forward uh, for Assistive Tech, he says that um, accessibility is options, right? At the end of the day, that's what it is. Mm. You're giving options. And and I think about that all the time. Like, why aren't there more options here? Right. So when we're thinking about the options we need to create, like, what are, what are some things we should be considering? I, I imagine there's some categories that might be I mean, to your point, nothing's going to, nothing's going to replace talking to people. I think having some categories to at least explore can help maybe even expose who should we, who we should be talking to. Yeah. I think, I think about things lately in terms of senses, you know, we, we think of our five senses and if we take away a sense, can we still experience that thing? And and that's how I like to look at things now. It's like, if I take away the sense of touch, how is how different is this? If I take away my sense of sight, how different is that? If I take away my sense of smell, how different is this thing? And I, I think that when we start to think about maybe exclusion from the start, then we can look at things differently. It's all perspective, right? Mm-hmm. And And again, providing those options. You know, it's like, it also makes me think too, that it's like not just binary. And even if we we don't have blind people in our meeting, they might be colorblind or they might be limited in some capacity. Right. Or someone might have low vision or, you know, how many people are feeling comfortable going to get their eyes checked and they know they need to. Yeah. I just got a notification saying you haven't had your eyes checked in like, yeah. A while. Absolutely. And I said, I need to go because things are, I could tell things are changing for me. So, you know, we, yeah, it is, it is really thinking about someone who's not us. Mm. And it's interesting. You talked about not getting your eyes checked. I mean, it's like how many people haven't bought blue blocking glasses or, Mm -hmm. you know, or have they been staring at a screen too long and, they're getting dizzy and maybe we, they, they need a break, you know? Yeah. It makes me think our design, if we have, if we were throwing too much stuff at people, we might be creating disabilities that they didn't even start with. Well, even, you know, I, I just, with, with this pandemic, I decided I'm going to buy a Nintendo switch and I bought the switch and I'm very excited because everybody talked about animal crossing and I was like, I can't wait to play. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I can't wait to play Mario Kart. And so I got my Switch. And uh, years ago, I had carpal tunnel issues in my right hand. And so I started doing a lot of things with my left hand. And when I use this controller, and after a while, my hand starts to hurt. And I just think there's no accessible controller for the the mm. Switch. You know, there is for Xbox, um, but I did actually just find an accessible controller that can lay flat, but it's only available in Japan at the moment for the Switch. I was like, why isn't this available in America? I mean, so give me the options, right? Just give me the options (laughs) to to do things different. You know, the irony was not lost on me that that the accessibility device was not accessible in the U.S. (laughs) Right. Yeah, it's not accessible in the U.S. So I was hoping I can figure out a way to get it from Japan. Yeah, that's so are there companies that specialize in aftermarket accessibility devices? Not that I'm, I'm not aware of any, but now you're making me curious to look. Yeah, I was wondering, so was this a device made by Nintendo and they just haven't brought it to the U.S. yet? It's not. I think, I want to say the company is Hero. Hmm. You know, I'm not sure of the name. What a noble mission that would be, you know? Like, hey, there's there's tons of products out here. They're not all necessarily accessible. We're going to provide aftermarket add-ons for everyone that's in need. I love that. Yeah, there is, um, in, in the U.S., there's a, an organization called Able Gamers Charity, and they do a lot of work to make gaming accessible. And so they might actually, I need to look into it more, but they might have some stuff. Yeah, that's cool. Because people end up building it themselves <laughs> if they can't, yeah, you know, if they I, can't make it. 
you know, I know. it's amazing. It. Like through, you know, just open source software and YouTube and, and online communities of all sorts. There's this amazing stuff that's been happening. In fact, I'm diabetic and there's people, there's diabetics that have taken it on themselves to reverse engineer the hardware and give build in more capabilities that the device manufacturers haven't been doing. And they've got they've now got two different devices that we depend on talking to each other. Wow. Because you know, that would require FDA clearance and the companies like getting partnerships built and like working together and so instead and their hashtag is we're not going to wait. And I love this idea of the consumers um, standing up for themselves and coming together and, you know, just making amazing stuff to, to better their lives. I mean, this is where things come from. I think, you know, a lot of times people will wait and I wish somebody would really come up with this, this thing. And even for me with, when I got asked to do the book, I was like, why, why would I, who wants me to write a book? Like, I, what do I, you know, what do I know? And I learned actually a lot as I wrote the book and I wrote the book because I got a lot of questions from students. I had questions and I answered those questions in the book. And sometimes when those things don't exist, you have to make them yourself. And the the disability community is, they are the most innovative group because they've had to make things work when they haven't been given that option, you know? So I think that we really should look at, and that's what I put in the book, like there's there's so much innovation that comes out of the disability community. Well, necessity, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> to follow the old quote. So I want to I wanna talk a little bit about your point that you made around how important it is to talk to the people. And I... I know that there's some folks that, I mean, there are some folks, I, I, I would be willing to wager that there's a large portion of the population that are afraid of those conversations because they don't know how to approach them. And so if you're going to invite someone with a handicap to, to the conversation, to be curious about their needs, do you have any advice on how to approach that conversation with, um, I don't know, generosity maybe? I think, going into it being open and not, you know, assuming anything. I I think that it's, we all come with our own bias. And I think we have to kind of put that to the side and be open to what people have to say and listen. And this is something, especially in this country, as of late, listening has been uh, something that's really hard to come by. Mm -hmm. And I heard this and I can't remember where, but it said, if you're questioning things, then you're open. And if you're saying statements, then you're closed minded. And I think that a lot of statements are made and not enough questions. And I think that asking questions and asking questions that are appropriate and not insulting uh, to people and, and listening to people's experience and having them tell their stories I think that our stories we all have are so important and need to be heard and and people need to listen to them. So that's what I would say is be open. And do you have any advice on the types of questions that are just really good? Because you you said, you know, you want to ask questions that aren't offensive. Mm -hmm. I think maybe that's where people get stuck, even if they, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of people that just aren't even trying. But the people that are trying, I think when they get stuck, it's it's probably because they're worried about offending and it's, it's easier just to clam up and not say anything. right? Cause, yeah, I think you can ask someone, how do they go about doing X, Y, Z thing? Yeah, so classic ethnography right? type stuff. Like, how do you go about your day to day functions of of work? Um, how do you how do you use Zoom? Are are there any difficulties or th- that you face and you know, ask why, you know, mm. to things because we, we need to, if you really want to get to understand, you have to ask the question why. Yeah. Um, and I'll give an example. This past spring, uh, I was talking with Gus and Gus, who is blind, was saying, we, I don't know, somehow we started talking about augmented reality because I, I have real interest in it. And we got on the subject of Pokemon Go. And he's like, I wish I could play Pokemon Go. And I thought to myself, why can't he play Pokemon Go? And because it's a very visual game, right? And it's not 
exactly easy to use with a screen reader. So we started a discussion uh, about this and what, it, what would it mean for an augmented reality experience uh, to be accessible for someone who's blind? And ultimately this led to a decision where Gus became my student's client and my students worked on creating a concept for an augmented reality experience for Gus. Mm. And uh, a lot of them came up with different games, games that use audio spatial sound and haptic feedback. And it was really great for the students to think outside the box because a few of them were asking me, how do we make augmented reality, which is a digital overlay over a physical space, into, you know, how do we do that? If, how do we make it? And it's not going to be visual. And I said, sound. Mm touch, feedback, you know, inputs and outputs. And they all came up with really cool stuff this past summer. And so um, there's opportunity there, but you have to be open to having the discussions and, and asking the questions and listening and working with people. Yeah, the spatial audio is really interesting to me. And, you know, especially as a facilitator who really loved working the room has now been confined to these digital compartments that we kind of whisk people to and fro. And, you know, with the spatial audio, you know, the idea of people clustering, that's a breakout group, but, you know, certainly folks that are vision impaired wouldn't know where to go. And so having the haptic feedback to have some indication of kind of, where they are in the space would be really, that's really fascinating. Yeah. So I, I'm curious more about just, you know, how we think about uh, as we're designing experiences for teams to meet and come together. What do you think the best way? Is? I, I, I mean, the, the first thing that comes to mind for me is maybe just actually taking the step to be aware that there might be some attendees in the meeting that may need special attention or, you know, we might need to design for their needs but are there any things that folks should be considering just in general as they design meetings to be more accessible? I think that, you know, looking at people, looking, looking at the four uh, areas uh, from the web content accessibility guidelines is a start, right? So you're looking for cognitive uh, mobility, hearing, and uh, vision, and having an understanding if if someone on your team um, has has any disabilities or and, and a lot of disabilities are not even uh, visible, right? Um, you you cannot see if someone is uh, dyslexic or colorblind. And I think it's making sure that the meetings themselves are ex as accessible as can be by providing captions when available or transcript if it's you know something after the fact because if um, certain plugins can capture transcripts and then any sort of documentation and making sure the documentation is accessible uh, making sure that pdfs are accessible for a screen reader and i i think that uh having an understanding of of the and having an awareness of the needs of accessibility for meetings, because I think that people, everyone has been strained with, with this pandemic. And no matter who you are, it's not been an easy time for anyone. And I think that we have an opportunity here to improve on existing systems by making them more accessible to everybody. So just just having that understanding of one awareness that not everybody's experiencing the, the thing as you do and that you need to provide options for people when they need them. You need to allow people to keep their cameras off if that's the case because they might have five kids running around, right? You need to provide captions when you can and on and on. So are there good resources out there to learn about the standards or, or how things are evolving so that we can stay in tune with you know new ideas and new ways to be more accessible yeah i i always like the the website webaim.org as a go-to resource because it's pretty 
all this stuff can be uh, extremely overwhelming, but I think they lay it out in a very good format. I would also uh, recommend equalentry.com. They have a lot of great blog posts related to accessibility that are, you know, uh, short little reads. And I'm trying to think what else that are, you know, for anybody new to it. But those are the two that I would recommend. Excellent. So good. And, you know, I guess, you know, considering where the world is and kind of what could be possible if we were willing to be more bold and take more risk, where do you think the opportunity is? Like, what could we, where do you see things going? Well, part of my my research now is looking into accessible XR, and XR stands for Extended Reality which is augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, and other immersive type experiences. And personally, I'm just going to be real. I think about myself and getting older and the fact that I still want to experience stuff. So I think when we make things accessible, it can be used throughout our lifetime. Mm. That we're not, you know, in the past, I've done this workshop designing for your future self, where I have people think about themselves as a 70 plus year old. And what does life look like? People go, why? This is depressing. I never thought about this. And I said, but why aren't we thinking about it? And why aren't we thinking about it with more hope and excitement? Mm. Because we have an opportunity now to make things for our older selves. And in turn, we're making things more accessible for people now. You know, so I, 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 Part of why I love what I do as an educator is that my students give me extreme hope to, for the future and and what can what we can do and how we can apply what we we know now and make things better for for the future well i just I just got goosebumps this like this concept of designing for your future self and the ripple effects it makes and the end how and the target that we set when we do that it's amazing yeah and i like that you said ripples because i think about everything as a ripple <laughs> awesome so i want to talk a little bit to you about just the notion of xr and how that in itself can create accessibility in itself oh well i mean there's a lot of work being done around xr and accessibility by my friend Thomas Logan, who he is the owner of Equal Entry. And th their XR extended reality is being used in therapy for folks. It's being used to help people uh, with Alzheimer's or dementia um, by using, you know, iPads and having them like direct them back to where they like their rooms if they're living in a facility. There's so many potential applications for this type of technology. And I think especially around augmented reality. And, you know, I look at like Mac rumors and things like this, that Apple is putting a lot of money into spatial audio. And I, I think about that, but I also think, well, what if someone's deaf? What, what are they experiencing then? Right. And so there's, I think there's a lot of opportunity to improve on our current lives, but not all of it is going to be technical, you know, or technological. I guess the, the thing that comes to mind, I, there's something I saw recently where Amazon were, was doing these little, I forget what they called it, but it, it, it's kind of like these little micro vacations that were virtual. Mm, yeah. And I thought, wow, that's really, I mean, I, some of my, I showed share it with a few people and they were kind of like, oh, no, that seems silly. Cause you know, they're avid travelers and I'm like, well, A, in this time of COVID, like I'm not getting on the plane. And then B, it would be kind of cool to go there before you visit. So you can kind of understand a little bit and you kind of experienced it. I didn't actually dive too deeply into it, but my vision of how cool it could be is like if you had a tour guide that was just like kind of slightly customizing it for you and answering your questions and if you kind of see it virtually. And, and then as you were talking about XR for accessibility, I, th I began to think about, you know, like physical therapy could be, yeah. you know, you maybe need to go in periodically, but like you could almost do it daily if it was just like a 15 minute check-in to make sure like, are you doing the thing you're supposed to do? Right. And like, you know, like, so it becomes more accessible 
by convenience or by like the fact that it's there and available versus like having to be tuned for their need, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I forgot to mention this, this, this semester, actually, my students are, my undergrad students are working with a nonprofit out of Seattle called Home Again VR, which uh, when people think about virtual reality, they tend to think, oh, I have to put on a headset. That's not necessarily the case. You can actually do web VR, which is more um, like a 360 type of experience. But this organization, Home Again VR, services folks who are elderly or children in hospitals. And it's the, the participant and a tour guide. And the tour guide will choose a location, let's say Tokyo, Japan. And they, the, the, the two people will be in separate locations, but they'll see the same things. And the tour guide will take them and sh- point out things and they'll start to have a conversation. And um, it's a really cool thing. So my students are working on giving some like ideas to, to how to improve on the tool. And I, I think there's a lot of, a lot of, not everybody can leave the house, right? So there, there's a lot of opportunity there as well. And I, I personally have been using in virtual reality, an app called Wander, and I have been able to kind of see the world in that way, even though I can't leave cool. my house. It's amazing, right? Just this notion that these things are being brought to us. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, it, it kind of reminds me of, you know, all the science fiction where, you know, people just tap into the second life, you know, or the simulation. Right. So, I mean, the the small thing can just take you to a new place. Absolutely. Yeah. It's fascinating to think about all the levels of technology, right? Because it's like, I'm sure there's focus on making existing stuff more accessible or creating systems that are just by nature solving an accessibility problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of work being done in different universities. Uh, There's an organization that I am part of called XR Access, which is being, I think Verizon's part of it, Cornell Tech is part of it, and they focus on different areas of extended reality accessibility from the hardware to, you know, looking at policies to education and, and different areas There's students in VR and educators in VR that are exploring those worlds. And the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, just last year had an event on inclusive design in in this field. And they've created some guidelines around XR and accessibility. So there there is some progress, but we still have a, a ways to go. Absolutely. So when you think about the difference between accessibility and inclusive design, how would you differentiate those? Well, I would call inclusive design the big umbrella and accessibility falls under that umbrella. Um, Uh, Because we don't really, you know, when people ask, how do you define inclusive design? I was like, well, you can look it up. I mean, you'll find different (laughs) things for it. But I I like to refer to Kat Holmes, who, who wrote the book Mismatch Design, who says we don't really know what inclusion is, but we know what exclusion is. Mm. Um, And so when we make things inclusive, we're also typically will include accessibility in that. But inclusive is is looking at things from a cultural perspective, uh, from a language perspective. It, it, It involves a little bit more than accessibility. Yeah, I think a lot of times the you know, the, when we think about designing meetings, it's the inclusivity piece that's so, so critical. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, we don't always run into the accessibility stuff because I think that really, well, when you're thinking about products that are going to have massive scale, you know, the likelihood that you're going to run into users that you never even meet, right? right. That you, you don't even know you're having to to address and, and support. Whereas like the inclusivity stuff it's definitely a challenge that I think we've faced all the time in meetings and whether we notice it or not, even more so in this new global environment we're finding ourselves in. Right. I mean, I've, I've been noticing things where, you know, the English speakers have an advantage because they can read the material faster and then, you know, then they're getting impatient while the other people are trying to catch up or there's lots of things. In fact, one that's really fascinating that I run into recently and it's been noticing this a lot so different cultures have different length of pause. Mm. That's like 
I would say their natural pause to indicate that there are no questions or they don't, no one has anything to add. And so if you mix two cultures that have one that has a really fast pause, they don't have to wait very long to make sure no one has anything to add versus in a culture that has a long pause <laughs> as a facilitator, you have a, uh, you have your work cut out for you because that the people from that short pause culture are going to o- run over those other folks. Right. Yeah. I think that that's something to account for even time, right. Mm-hmm. And time differences and understanding that if you're having a meeting early, it might be late for people and people may not be their sharpest when it's, you know, midnight. So, <laughs> and it's earlier for you. So I, there's so many considerations when it comes to inclusive design that we need to consider. Absolutely. So what do you think there's any, like, just kind of switching back to the accessibility piece, are there things that you would encourage folks just to keep top of mind more than anything as they think about their meetings? Like, are there any blind spots that are just kind of easy to, maybe not e- easy is a difficult word to grapple sometimes, but like, what are some things that that people could just kind of have on their checklist? Oh, what is a checklist? I, I think being mindful of people's situations, their time zones, how people communicate, as you alluded to, when it comes to how people pause and or, or don't pause. I, I think making sure that uh, documentation is available, providing an, a, a meeting agenda so people know what to expect are, are things that, that are just, you know, considerate. And I, I think being considerate in the space where we are all a little bit um, struggling, I think, from time mm-hmm. to time. So I, I think, you know, for sure, coming to the meeting with a, a clear agenda um, and making sure that you are mindful of people's time, because our time is 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 so different now with being home. And if people have families, that, that really needs to be taken into consideration. Absolutely. And I, I think, too, there's a big opportunity to, as a facilitator, be vulnerable yourself. Right. Because if we don't model that behavior, how can we expect those in the audience to speak up, Mm -hmm. you know, if they're not being supported? And so we need to work hard to support them, but then also, like, you know, maybe maybe not come off so polished that people are afraid to, to disrupt things. Right. Excellent. Well, it's been a super pleasure chatting with you and the work you're doing is super important and really, I would say, hopeful to think about. And especially, I'm going to be thinking about this, like planning your your future self or designing for that. It's um, really provocative. So I want to just give you an opportunity to leave the listeners with a final message. Oh, well, uh, thank you. Thank you for having me uh, on the show. I want folks to think about, you know, one of the things that I I ask first in my book is, have you ever wanted to go somewhere and you couldn't get in? And how did that make you feel? Mm. Or did you really want something and you couldn't get it? Uh, How did that make you feel? And most folks will say, I didn't feel very good. And at the end of the day, you know, um, a friend of mine said, we are an experience as, as human beings, right? And we create experiences. And what we don't want to do is we don't want to leave people out. We don't want to uh, have people feel like they're not wanted. And we want to be more inclusive in that way, right? We want people to feel included. So I would say don't leave people with the feeling that you've probably experienced yourself and be more inclusive and accessible in yourself and what you do in your work. Awesome. It was such a pleasure having you on the show. Thanks again. Oh, thank you. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Control the Room. Don't forget to subscribe to receive updates when new episodes are released. And if you want more, head over to our blog where I post weekly articles and resources about working better together. VoltageControl.com